In past videos, we've looked at so many themes that connect the Old Testament to the New. We looked at how Moses, in many ways, is a prophetic foreshadowing, a typology or prophetic parallel of Jesus. We've looked at this through the life of Jonah. We see something similar with the life of Abraham. And so many of the stories of the Old Testament point to Jesus and what he's going to do through his people even today. The same can be said for prophet Elijah. That's what we are exploring today as we break down hidden themes in some of our recent episodes. And we're going to see how the story of Elijah and Elisha parallels Jesus and the church. Stay tuned. Moses, we saw how he did many things that parallel Christ. He fasted for 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. He left his royal status as a prince of Egypt to join the low status of his people to save them, which Jesus did by leaving eternity to come into our fallen world to save us. There are just many parallels there. And this is intentional by God to illustrate his salvation plan even before Jesus came into the world. We see something similar with Elijah and Elisha. So first of all, I wanted to go through here um, a few parallels between Elijah and Jesus. And if you've seen our recent Elijah episode, The Spirit of Elijah, you might have noticed these as you were watching the episode. And we didn't really touch on this, but now I really want to just highlight some of these because it's spectacular how when you read the Old Testament and you realize that it is really God telling a story of his entire salvation plan for humanity, you see so much in, in how it relates to Jesus and what his message is. So first, you will find that many point out that Elijah is a typology of Jesus. He's a prophetic parallel. Just like Moses can be considered one, uh, the story of Abraham can be considered uh, a typology of what would happen with Christ, just like Abraham offered his son, God offered his son, but he truly did become a sacrifice. And so with the story of Elijah, we see that Elijah is kind of like a Christ figure in the story. And Elisha is kind of like a prophetic parallel of us believers, the church. God illustrates that by allowing Elijah to do certain things that should immediately allow us to think of Jesus. Okay. What are some of those things? Well, one thing that Elijah did when he first came onto the scene was he rebuked the leaders of Israel for giving into idolatry, for not worshiping God the right way. And he rebuked them for how they handled what God had given them. Well, who did Jesus rebuke? The Pharisees. He rebuked the leaders of Israel. The people of God when he was on the scene, he didn't really rebuke the, the Roman authorities as much as he rebuked the Pharisees for mishandling what God had given them. And so there's a link between the rebuke of Elijah and the rebuke of Jesus. They both came to rebuke the leaders of Israel. Now, Elijah also did something else that should immediately make you think, hmm, this is kind of familiar. Jesus did this in first Kings chapter 17, Elijah multiplied oil and he multiplied a, a meal for a starving widow and her son. And so he had this ability to multiply food through the power of God. Who else multiplied food? <laughs> Jesus did. The loaves and fish for the crowds who had come to hear him, Jesus operating through his power, multiplied food for the sustenance of his people. We see also that Elijah was given the power to raise individuals from the dead. 
Uh, there was the widow's son who had died and Elijah prayed and the son came back to life. Jesus did something similar. He was known for raising people to life. He raised Lazarus, the little girl. It's the power of God. Another prophetic parallel between Elijah and Jesus is a period of fasting for 40 days. Interesting, right? We see that Moses fasted for 40 days and he paralleled Jesus. Well, it seems as if the same thing happened with Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, 8, Elijah was given food by an angel and he was told that this food would sustain him for a 40 day journey to a mountain. So he ate food and didn't have to eat again for 40 days. I don't know what kind of food that was, but it was, he didn't have to eat. And so he kind of went on a period of fasting for 40 days until he reached that mountain. And we know that this parallels Jesus when he was baptized and then he fasted for 40 days on mountains without food. He was sustained by the power of God. So I wanted to just show briefly there that Elijah and Jesus had many connections. Now, if Elijah in the story is a parallel or a type of Jesus, who is Elisha? Well, Elisha, or some would say Elisha, can represent the church in many ways. How so? Well, remember in the story, in order for Elisha to receive power from Elijah, he had to follow him. He had to leave his life behind and keep his eyes on him. And that was the only way that he would be able to receive power from him. He was called to faithfulness and leaving the world behind, leaving his world behind to follow him. The same thing is said for us as followers of Christ. We're called to leave the world behind to follow Christ. And I would say that the biggest thing that shows Elisha as a type of the church is how he received the spirit of Elijah after his ascension to heaven. Right. Elijah was taken to heaven and he was told that he would only receive that spirit if he kept his eyes on him. Now, how do we operate in power as believers? How do we operate in Holy Spirit power? Number one, by leaving the world behind as, as Elisha had to. Number two, by staying close to your leader. Who was that? Jesus staying close to him, just like Elisha had to stay close to Elijah and by keeping your eyes fixed on Christ. Elisha was told by Elijah that the only way he would receive this power is if he kept his eyes on him. If we keep our eyes on Christ, we see how we are able to operate as the Holy Spirit would like to operate in our lives too, as the church. So the parallel is so strong. It's such a great connection. And another interesting thing is this. Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And so by receiving a double portion of the anointing that was on Elijah, Elisha was able to do twice as many things as Elijah did. This is interesting because if Elisha was able to do more than Elijah, is there any indication in scripture that the church, that we would be able to do more powerful things than even Jesus? Well, look at what Jesus said in John 14, 12. He was uh, telling his followers that he would be going to the father, that he would be ascending and going to heaven. And he was promising them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And look what he says. <laughs> he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And so Jesus let them know that once they received his spirit, his Holy Spirit, that they would do amazing things as well if they believed, if they were his people because he was ascending. In a similar way, we see that in the story, Elisha did greater things than Elijah. And so I want to just say this. If Elisha represents the church, there's a lot we can learn about his life. OK, one thing we can learn is keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Also, I will say this. Elisha was a powerful man, and we know that we know that he did double of what Elijah did. 
Now, with him being so powerful, you might have assumed that maybe he would ascend to heaven like Elijah did. Maybe he would have an awesome death experience. Well, that's not exactly what happened with him. It says that Second Kings 13. Now, Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. And then Jehoash, the king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. Now, I want to just stop there. The first part of that says, now Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. And then after that, it talks about how the king of Israel went to visit him. And so we see here that, number one, the king of Israel went to visit Elisha while he was sick. And then we see here that he eventually died from this illness. Now, you may be thinking, wait a second. This man was a prophet, right? Like he he healed the sick. He helped those who couldn't do for themselves. He was operating in the double anointing of Elijah, but he ended up dying from an illness. Wow. If there's any message in that, I think it might be this. Sometimes in our lives, we wonder why do bad things happen to us? You know, why do we get sick? Why do why did someone who I knew was a child of God? Why did they have to have that terrible thing happen to them? And I think we can be reminded through Alicia that even though God can use you and has his power over you, don't be defeated by what happens in this life to you, because it's not the end of your story. Alicia was sick. He died from his illness. But his ultimate hope is not in this life. If it was, then he never would have been sick. His ultimate hope is in resurrection, the hope that we all have. It is when that happens that we will be completely made whole, completely healed of all ailments. And even Alicia, experience hardship. Even he and his extreme power and anointing experience tough times, illnesses that even took him out, which goes to show that God doesn't call us to just health, wealth and prosperity. God doesn't say, once you come to my side and I use you that you're never going to get sick again. No, he says, I'm with you. And even on your worst days, still serve me, still be on my side. And so I think there's a profound message for us in that this powerful man, he died of a sickness. So I want to show a few parallels there, and there are a ton more that you can find in the reading for yourself. Uh, this is just a little short preview, and I just want to continue to say that when you read the Old Testament, realize that these stories aren't just there just because God thinks it's a good story. The entire purpose and reason of it is to foreshadow and prophesy and parallel Jesus, his return, his coming, his people, the kingdom, everything in Christ is in the Old Testament. It's all there. And so part of the joy of reading these Old Testament stories is being able to discover these things and see the connections and see the parallels. And it makes it that much more amazing. There is nothing more deep than God's word. With that being said, transitioning, I want to talk a little bit about our recent projects that we have uploaded for you. Uh, the Two Witnesses movie part two and the Spirit of Elijah video. And we're going to look at some hidden things within those episodes that you might have missed. And so if you haven't seen them, you can look in the description and see the links to them. You're definitely going to want to check those out because I think you will find them um, enriching to you. And one thing that we looked at in the Two Witnesses movie part two was the significance of the lampstands of Revelation. We had to investigate this. Because Revelation 11, 4 says that the two witnesses are the two lampstands. And that's interesting because, you know, when you look at the scripture, the only other place that refers to lampstands being given numbers is the book of Revelation. When it talks about seven lampstands, the angel interprets those seven lampstands as being seven churches. And we looked at how 
there were two out of those seven that were not rebuked. There were two out of those seven that were faithful to God. And um, definitely see the documentary to find out which two those are. I don't want to just give it all away here. But those two end time churches are found there. And it's really interesting how the book of Revelation then says that those two churches, those two lampstands are the two witnesses. And so the interesting thing about that is I always wondered why it says that the two witnesses are the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. I always wondered what did it mean by that and why did it, why did it say that? And I think there are many different interpretations of why it might say these are the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Um, I think I am leaning with that meaning. Hey, when John saw Jesus, how many lampstands were there? There were seven standing before him. Five of them were, were rebuked, but there were two that were standing before the Lord that were faithful. And so for me, when I see that it says these witnesses, these end time witnesses are the two lampstands, the two churches that were standing before the, before the Lord, I think that it kind of fits well to see those two lampstands as the two that were left before him who were favored in his eyes and were commended by him. And so just a little thing that we didn't talk about in the movie, but I want to bring light to because I think it's interesting how that kind of connects there. Another thing is that many have wondered, why is it that it says that the stars in Jesus' hand are the seven angels of the churches, and then it says the seven lampstands are the seven churches? Um, what does it mean by seven angels? Well, actually, in the Elijah video, we looked at how there are seven angels who blow a trumpet, and after they blow that trumpet, what happens? There's earthquakes, there's plagues, there's all types of pestilences that take place. And so I just want to quickly say that it is likely that the seven angels who blow the trumpets are the same seven angels who are the angels of the churches. And if the seven churches represent seven states of believers, I don't believe it's seven denominations, but I believe it's seven conditions of his body, then perhaps there is an angel that overshadows each. Now, this is something that I can ask you. How does that work? Is it based upon geographic location? Is it based upon uh, just a, a person's heart? Why is it seven churches? That's something that I'm, I'm still working through. OK, I'm still working on that myself. Um, but please share in the comments if you have any ideas there. And um, another thing that I want to point out with the two witnesses movie, too, is that uh, you, you just when you watch these episodes, you really do want to notice the imagery because everything there is a purposeful. I believe a lot of it is God allowing things to be presented in a way to say something better than we could ever narrate. And uh, a lot of times there are little hidden things that you will find the third and fourth time of watching it that you never would have saw before. And so uh, definitely when you watch it, you'll notice little things that were intentionally put there. One thing that was intentionally put there uh, is uh, these references to the third and seventh day. You might, some of you might not have even, even thought twice about that, but that is really a huge thing. Um, throughout the Two Witnesses movie, there are a couple of these. And that's really just a preview of what we're going to be talking about on the channel. Uh, after a few episodes, because the number three and the number seven are connected in Bible prophecy. Those numbers are very important in Bible prophecy, and they're huge, very huge. And they have huge implications for when these end time things that we've been talking about are going to kick off. No one knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. We don't know the day or the hour. Jesus says that. But he always wanted us to know the season. And so we're going to look at three, seven, 40 Jubilee years and a whole bunch of other things that we're going to look at the season of this, because I know you are all wondering, like, we know uh, what the Antichrist is. We know what the two witnesses may be. We know the what, but when, but when, you know, we know the what, we know the where, but we need to know the when, right? We need to know when we really need to start getting ready for this. And so three and seven, 
just hang on. We got a few more episodes to go, and then we're going to tackle some interesting things. And I think it's going to change things big time. Now, another thing I want to say about the Two Witnesses movie is that you'll notice that in the end, it has a call for unity among all people, all groups, blacks, whites, Asians, whatever. We want to have unity. And that was actually a theme that was expressed throughout the entirety of the film. And there was a reason for that. The film is primarily about looking at and examining the two lampstands, correct? And we saw that the two lampstands who will be used by God in the end times were criticized by those who claim to be the true Jews. So it was very intentional for this entire production to call for unity among people groups because we see here that one of the primary attacks against God's people will be from those who are claiming to be his true people because of their race. And so we had to really have a theme of unity and not division. And that starts off from the very beginning of the film. when You see the talk about the olive trees and how we are all grafted into the olive tree of Jesus, no matter our race, we are all grafted into his people through faith. And um, so I think that's a, a, a powerful theme. And as you watch it, just notice the themes of unity and, and racial harmony that you will find there. One last thing I want to say about the Two Witnesses movie part two is that um, there was a hidden message that mentioned something about got the coat. Um, and I think that perhaps the spirit of Elijah video can also shed light on maybe what that may refer to, among other things, coat the spirit of Elijah. And speaking of Elijah, now well, let's talk about some of the imagery in the Spirit of Elijah video. So um, in this video, you will see that often there is a symbolism of light. OK, you'll see lights appear in interesting places. You'll see lights come in and out. And that's a representation of the Holy Spirit power of God. You know, even in the two witnesses videos, um, if you even go back to the first two witnesses documentary and then look at the two witnesses episode, you'll see that whenever the people of God were uh, empowered through his spirit, well, there's these lights that show up. Right. And so this has been a theme that has gone through all of these videos, the importance and power of light. And you might have seen people walking around with lights on their hands then and didn't really make the connection. But hopefully in the Elijah spirit video, you were able to see how the light is all tied into the anointing of Elijah. You see the light here uh, upon Elijah. And then even when Jesus himself is baptized and he rises up, that same type of anointing, that light is shown upon him because he is then, as the Bible says, and Luke is filled with the spirit and he's filled with power. And so there's this Holy Spirit power upon John the Baptist, upon Jesus, upon Elijah. And whenever you see that, you also see lights. And then those same lights are then, of course, upon those who operate through his Holy Spirit. You, me, the witnesses. That's just another thing that uh, you can notice. And um, again, there are many little things like that. Uh, just, you know, as you watch the videos, think about it. And uh, you'll see things that even I didn't intend to put in there that um, God just kind of allowed to line up to tell a story that goes beyond what we intended. Now, questions, questions. These videos have brought about a lot of questions. As I said, we read the comments, we grow from each other, we learn from each other. And so your questions are so important. And um, one question is, why did Elijah have to ascend? You know, why did he even have to leave? Why couldn't he have died? And, you know, I, I'm not really sure of the exact answer for that. Um, why did he have to ascend? Now, now, here is something that I've thought about. I've wondered if going to heaven is necessary to allow someone to receive the anointing of your spirit. I've wondered about that because we know that. Elisha was not able to operate in Elijah's anointing until Elijah had ascended to heaven. Once he ascended to heaven, or I guess was carried to heaven, no one's ascended except Jesus, but he was carried in a chariot. Uh, once he was in heaven, then he was able to somehow share his spirit. So I don't know, maybe you have to be off of the earth to share your spirit with someone. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, we know that Jesus had to ascend to share his spirit with us. He said that the only way that he could give us his Holy Spirit was 
after he first ascended. And so it seems like I'm not sure. I'm just saying it seems like um, there is a purpose in someone rising and going to where God is. And then after that, giving their mantle upon those who follow them. We saw that with Elisha and we see it with us as the church. Another question that people ask, John the Baptist, did he have the Holy Spirit? In the video, I mentioned that I wasn't sure if he had the double portion anointing because he died before the Pentecost. And we know that with that, the Holy Spirit came upon us with, with power. And that's when the apostles were able to do amazing things, clear evidence of power. But many of you pointed out uh, Luke 1 15, which does say that um, John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from birth. And that's that's true. My understanding of that has always kind of been like because I know that prophets in the Old Testament received the Holy Spirit. Like I know that the, the Holy Spirit would appear upon them and they would do incredible feats through them. My understanding was that they weren't that the Holy Spirit wasn't like attached to in them or it didn't really indwell in them, but kind of just came upon them and then left. I've always looked at the Holy Spirit as something that was only able to live within us permanently once Jesus resurrected. But with John the Baptist, it does say that he was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. So would, maybe you can help me out here. Uh, do you think that the that the Holy Spirit was in John the Baptist the same way that it is in us today? Or was it on him in a kind of a different way? Something to think about, something to think about. But either way, we know the Holy Spirit was very active in the Old Testament and even active in the life of John. And um, it's certainly active today. And so uh, thank you for listening to this commentary. I hope that you enjoyed the previous productions and we have a lot more coming. As I said, there's a lot more typology we got to look into, a lot more prophetic parallels we have to look into, a lot more things that relate to numbers, uh, jubilee years. And uh, it's, it's, it's incredible to think about um, the release of them because it's really going to take what we've been building here on the channel to a new level. Everything from season one, season two, and we are now in season three, it's going, it's, it's all building up towards this big release on the numbers. Okay, so, you know, these videos aren't something that are just, you know, you can watch once and then you're done with it. I would say go back and watch even the season one and season two episodes, especially the ones regarding um, the Hosea prophecy. That right there really also talks about the, the number three. Um, also, the one about the prophetic parallels of Moses. Um, there's just so many, and they are all building up to a theme of how God has put so much hidden material within his word that is obvious, but now he's really bringing it to light to prepare us for what is coming into the world. There's a lot to look forward to. A lot of you have asked, how can you uh, support our work here? And there's really, um, there's three ways, okay? You can, of course, pray for us. We always need prayers that nothing will come against what we're doing, that God will continue to protect it. Uh, number two, share the videos. That is so important how um, you can share the link with your friends, family, even your church members. And so that's, that's so helpful. Uh, maybe even use them in your Bible studies. And then number three, uh, can, you can contribute to this work. Um, we we need it. You know, we do this full time. We put all of our energy, all of our efforts into it. And so uh, we need your support. Um, we work with Yante Osterberg. He's a, a th I think, a brilliant 3D CGI artist. And you can see his work in um, our recent productions. He did the lampstands. He did the olive trees. He's done so many different things, models of Jesus. And you can see that his work is very complex. And um, we pay him, people like him, we pay camera operators to film sequences. And so um, with your contributions, we are able to really become what God is calling us to be. And that's a producer of content for the kingdom. And so you can, of course, support us on Patreon or PayPal uh, in the description. And also, if you would like to have more communication with us and see what's kind of going on behind the scenes, so you can check us out there and maybe even have more conversations with the team. God bless you. Uh, it's been great going over these things and stay tuned for the next one. Take care.